Good morning, uh, ladies Good morning, and gentlemen. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity like to, 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 um, um, to thank, um, to um, to uh, thank uh, the president and uh, the organizing committee and the members of the U.S. section for this uh, very gracious invitation and uh, the opportunity to be here with you uh, today. The topic that I would like to talk about is the role of 3D printing out of biliary surgery and discuss some of the uh, uh, work that we had, uh, that we did at the university in Greece and some of the challenges and opportunities that we faced. Overall, this started as a research program of 3D printing for the management of liver masses and uh, it was a collaboration between the medical school and uh, the Department of uh, Transplant and Fatabilary Surgery, together with the uh, School of the Engineering School and the Department of Rural Serving and Engineering, uh, as well as uh, the hospital where it took place. We'll talk about some the protocol itself, the applications of 3D printing, and whether it's just something fancy or something of actual value, as well as the future challenges. Some pictures from Thessaloniki, where I'm from. This is the White Tower, which is a symbol of the city. A couple of centuries ago, this used to be in the sea. The sea used to go all the way out over there. These are different parts of uh, the city, and I certainly encourage all of you to visit now that we're moving slowly away from the low camps. What is 3D printing? 3D printing is essentially a process of making a 3D solid object of virtually any shape from a digital model. And the way we do that is using an additive manufacturing process where you place successive layers of material in different shapes, one on top of the other. And this is obviously a very simple way of explaining it and there, is, there are many more details involved uh, having to do with all the different parameters of types of material, uh, speed, uh, colors, and so on, as we will see. And you can have different things uh, produced for different reasons, whether it's commercial, whether it's health, whether it's something um, as simple or as beautiful as opportunity for a blind parent to heal a baby before it's born. These are very initial stages, or whether it's something which for us may not seem sound very complicated or important, but can make a huge difference in terms of local healthcare and global um, health, which is something that the ICS does care about. And that is 3D printing cord umbilical cord clamps in Haiti. These are some of the earlier work, and one of the things that um, we started was instruments. And uh, the goal was to combine the 3D printing of instruments with different types of materials so that they could withstand uh, sterilization process. And then uh, using nanotechnology to add a layer for, which would be antimicrobial. And that's also an ongoing project that we have. Again, pictures from Greece. I'm, I'm trying to encourage tourism, as you can all see. These are some of the beaches that are all over Greece, and these are very close to Thessaloniki, which is here, as you can see on the map. And this area is full of summer resorts less than an hour away. So this started as a team effort, together with the medical school, the engineering school, the uh, radiology department, hospital, as well as the private sector. And the goal was to take uh, lesions from a CT um, using a portal to exchange with the radiology exam and to communicate between the different parties, digitize and incorporate the 2D models into 3D models, and then transfer them electronically so they could be printed with a 3D printer and create the mold, fill the material, and then be able to have the actual liver with the mass. And this is um, easier said than done because there are many factors to consider, including 
the fact that the liver is as we all know, parenchyma, um, arteries, veins, uh, bile ducts, so a lot of different materials. And then take that model and use it to uh, plan the surgery, train uh, fellows, train residents, medical students, as well as for the surgeons, for the experienced surgeon to look at the picture and see whether it makes a difference. And at the same time, educate the patient on what's going to happen. And here you can see some of the digitization process, which is how it started originally. And in the beginning, we had to do this by hand, uh, which would be that you have to form the shape of the liver and go around all the different axes and uh, make sure that you incorporate everything. And this is interesting because our colleagues from the engineering school uh, became quite knowledgeable in the liver anatomy in the process. Um, but the point here being that once you start and when it's really a process that takes time. Now, what they did subsequently, they came up with a program that could do that automatically. And this made a huge difference. And once you do the digitization process, the, one, the next one is to model. And here, it evolved, this evolved to the point where we could do that with an iPad and, uh, or any tablet. And basically, you go around the model that you want and without that moving. And here is a hand. And you end up, as you can see here, with the 3D model of the hand, which subsequently you can print and you see the end result here. And this is very important because you can use that also once you take out the mass from uh, during the surgery, then one of the things we've been doing is using this, we get the 3D model of the mass so that we can compare the before and after results. And here's a printer, this printer of something else, not liver, but again, it's a process that can take time, can take days, especially the more complex it is, the more heads. Printing heads are needed and depending on the material itself. Uh, you can see how it evolved. And these were the first shapes, which obviously you can try to imagine this being a liver, but this is where it kind of starts. And again, we were not a big company. We didn't have significant funding. This was very when, but um, and this evolves over time. And the goals were to be able to analyze the CT or MR picture to create a 3D printable model, and then train uh, medical students, residents, fellows, uh, as well as attendings. Also see whether it makes a difference in informing the patient, the relatives, whether they understand and improve or the consent is more of an actual consent. And then also plan the strategy of the whole surgical procedure. And these were all issues that had to be evaluated. The key thing that we learned was the importance of multidisciplinary collaboration. Here's a picture of some of the Greek talents. Now, where have things involved? The whole goal of hepatic surgery today is navigation in terms of doing more targeted precision surgery, whether it's an ultrasound system like the Mavis or the Pathfinder, with the ultrasound being key in open and uh, laparoscopic surgery, hepatic surgery, or systems like the Mavis where you can get the uh, topography, the geography of the mass or the Pathfinder, where you have the CT and then you can locate and scan using a scanner during surgery to see exactly where you are. Again, the same concept being precision-based medicine, identify the exact location of the tumor, so to have a more targeted and thus potentially more safe operation. Here we see pictures from Aircat where they can superimpose the lesion. Now, how will this evolve? Potentially the goal is to evolve to bioprinting. And bioprint would be the situation where what you print uses biological material so as to be able to print using cells. Here we see an example 
can be used when living donor liver transplantation, printing and comparing what comes out of what stays, certainly with biliary anatomy, because it can give you a much better picture of what you're seeing in the film. And the whole goal is to be able, and to do it yourself, for the surgeon to be able to scan the area and see the area that they want to intervene. Now, one of the things that we saw, and how this evolved, you see the early pictures here, was that we could uh, be able to see the mass. This was a very central located mass, and we were able to plan the resection in a much safer way. And we also saw opportunities and situations, rather, where certain tumors that were not clearly seen on the CAT scan came out on the 3D printed model. And this is a metastatic, uh, metastatic lesion for the green. And one of these, these two were not clear on the CT scanner. So it can actually help and make a difference sometimes with the findings. These uh, are called meteora, which means hanging from the sky. And it's basically monasteries which are on top of these two roads. Now, what are some of the challenges and opportunities? There are several points of caution with 3D printing. One is that size does matter. And small size differences, when we're talking about millimeters, can make a difference. The cost is significant, especially the more colors you use, the uh, sturdier the material, the more different types of coloring material you can use. And also the fact that the result depends on your starting material, which is how good the picture on the CT or the MR is. The quality of that picture is what will determine the end product, the 3D plant model. And of course, what's a holy grail, but it's also something that can uh, we talk about it, but never actually get to it, is bioprinting with the aim of getting to artificial organs. So the whole idea is that you can print a scaffold and then instead of um, different types of ink, use bio ink, which is set cells. And stem cells are the perfect example for this to create this combination of the scaffold and the stem cells. And in the proper environment, this can give you the beginning of tissue, the beginning of an organ. And this has been done with small parts. Obviously, these are not full organs. These are very small parts. And the reason is the more further ahead you go with the printing, the harder it is in terms of having an adequate vascular supply. And here you can see how the bioink essentially cells can be used. And because there are cell cultures, eventually they become active and you end up with a more, more active product, which is in a 3D tissue type of culture, which can be the beginning. Some of the other steps that we're looking at is basically combining 3D printing with augmented reality. And using that model to uh, project that using a tablet or even a phone, and uh, whether that's into the air so you can plan the surgery or into the patient or on top of the liver so you can use that during the surgery. And again, it's not necessarily that these are uh, you know, tremendous innovations. These are ideas that are happening, but what we're working on is a very uh, financially conscious way to do that. The reason being that the resources are not the same all over the world. And this is some of the things that we have done. Here you can see using a phone can project the liver with the different the arteries, the veins, the mass into any area and one of these being onto the actual liver itself. Closing, this is uh, close to uh, Thessaloniki, about a half an hour away, which is the tomb of Philip, Alexander the Great's father. And this is where uh, the sarcophagus where Philip's bones were found. 
So can we create an organ? We're not there yet, and it's not easy because um, it's a technical issues. It's a vascularization of the whole organ that's a problem. And there are, of course, several ethical issues. So the key things here are one is a multidisciplinary collaboration. We got to look around us, open our eyes and ears, and learn from our colleagues and other uh, disciplines. It's very important uh, to do that. 3D printing needs to be fully evaluated so that we find where its proper place is. And it's not just something quote unquote fancy or uh, nice to look at, but it's actually practical. And we always, of course, have to remember that technology is not a substitute for technique. Well, thank you very much for having me at this uh, excellent conference speaking about the subject that I'm very passionate about. I do apologize. I wish I could be there in person today, but unfortunately, I'm not able to. And also, a thank you to Dr. Tab Canby, my partner, but also the president that was kind enough to invite me to speak about uh, this uh, subject that I'm very passionate about. Um, I'm Dr. Curtis Peary. I practice in uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, in the Midwest of the United States. I have extensive robotic experience and also robotic uh, experience with training other surgeons to become um, the best robotic surgeon possible. I've personally been able to take my uh, practice uh, that is mainly a minimally invasive surgical practice and uh, make it a total practice uh, robotic general surgeon. I do have uh, two disclosures, Intuitive Surgical and Surge On, which is a social media app for surgeons. Objectives of this talk is really to discuss what does a total practice surgeon really mean? Is there advantages to being a total practice surgeon? Uh, what are the pitfalls and how do you avoid them if you want to become a total practice robotic surgeon? What resources are available to you to help you attain that goal? And finally, I want to discuss three skill sets that I feel that a general surgeon should have if they become a total practice robotic surgeon. So what is a, a total practice robotic general surgeon? Well, that is essentially a surgeon who prefers the robotic platform compared to either an open approach or a laparoscopic approach. I think specifically it's a laparoscopic approach, which means essentially the vast majority of cases seem to be more amenable to your robotic approach because you've been able to acquire a high level of proficiency using the robotic platform. I think one of the limitations that we have with laparoscopy is not always the right uh, tool in each surgeon's hands. And I think that is a major reason why we see significant changes in uh, outcomes um, and even in centers of excellence. Here is uh, my personal experience. I think this uh, really tells the entire story because I feel that I made many of the mistakes that I see general surgeons make when they start to use the robotic platform. I started clear back in 2004 and I really feel that I essentially had two separate careers in robotic surgery. In 2004, I made many of the same mistakes and had some of the limitations that I feel many surgeons are experiencing today. Uh, for instance, I had the wrong mindset. I think all of us general surgeons feel that we're excellent surgeons. And when I looked at the technology, I felt that it was intriguing, but I did not necessarily feel that I need to have it for every type of case I needed uh, to perform on a daily basis. So I was really reserving uh, the platform for um, my most complex and unusual cases in which I did not feel that I was performing at a high level. That set me up for failure. What I mean by that is I uh, uh, was only doing the occasional case. So I had lack of contact with my team. And so I, I personally did, did not develop the proficiency or the team mindset and the communication that is required when you're sitting at the council away from the patient. This actually then led to an access problem. So 
since I was using it less frequently than say the gynecologist and the urologist. I did, was not given a block time. And as they became uh, busier, I had less and less access um, with a surgical platform. And what essentially happened is I almost fell out in 2011 and 12. But then in 2013, I actually had a report from the MDSAQ IP report, which showed that I had a very high stricture rate in my gastric bypasses. Considering that I had that outcome measure, I, it kind of proved to me that I was not as good of a general surgeon as I thought I was, and it made me reevaluate what I was doing. And so once I started doing my robotic gastric bypasses, I once again attained some uh, team communication skills and, a, and really worked well as a team, but also proficiency on the robot, because I continue to have regular, ongoing, frequent access to the robot, and I could see my skill set improve, 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 and also pointed out some other additional advantages of the um, robotic platform in which I had not earlier uh, appreciated. And I found out particularly in 2015, when we uh, got the latest platform, which was much more useful to a general surgeon, I felt that it was the best platform for many reasons in my hand. So therefore, it's infrequent that I would do a laparoscopic or open case at all. Here's an example of that in which I'm, I'm sewing an astomosis at the gastrojejunostomy. I'm also using the advanced technology to perform a leak test in which I place ICG and saline into the abdomen. So I have one, it's a better tool. I'm able to do very sophisticated maneuvers, uh, but and it allowed me with that frequent access to attain a high level of proficiency. And that um, proficiency um, also improved um, efficiency with my team and such. But mainly, it also incorporated all the technology into one platform. So here, not only I have excellent ability to dissect um, and to uh, perform the surgery, such as suturing, but I also have the, uh, the ability to do fluorescent imaging for the leak test. But then also, he, you see here, I place ICG um, intravenously. It collects in the liver and allows me to dissect quite readily between the liver and the adhesions in the upper abdomen to the stomach. So how do you attain this high level of proficiency? Um, well, it, it is a long course in which that um, it's individualized for each surgeon. It really depends on your practice, but you'll come across many different pitfalls and I wanna point those out to you. The number one pitfall is really you. Um, it comes with the wrong mindset, once again, we will think that, we, hey, we don't want to use this platform unless we absolutely need it. Well, what happens then is if you're using it infrequently, you do not let, develop your proficiency, um, you don't develop efficiency with your team, and you just don't realize what the platform is capable of giving you. And for that reason, um, you can really limit on how you do things. Well, another example of that is you know, if you try to replicate what you're doing laparoscopically, you may come across some barriers that decrease your uh, ability to perform the surgery to your liking. You really need to have an open mind. And uh, I encourage people to watch uh, videos from other surgeons and develop mentor-mentee relationships. The next big problem is access. Uh, this can be for various reasons. Uh, one is uh, if you have limited access on a platform, you don't have block time because you use it infrequently, which was my case then you just may find that you're not able to accumulate those cases rapidly enough or frequently enough that you get to that high level of performance. The surgical platform itself can be an issue. Um, we are fortunate enough at my institution to have four of the most advanced um, robotic platforms. Those platforms continue to evolve over time by incorporating improved staplers, energy sources for vessel sealing, um, and the imaging with the force of imaging and many other small aspects that actually becomes very useful for the general surgeon. If you don't have access to the most recent platforms, then it can really be a hamper on what your ability is able uh, to perform these complex procedures. Finally, training. When I started in 2004, I had to figure out a lot of things to myself, uh, but now there are many different training modalities, whether through industry or through um, surgical societies, or with previous partners or during residency programs. In fact, 40% of robotic surgeons currently are graduating with a letter of, of a cert, uh, excuse me, a certificate in which it says that they're adequately trained to perform robotic surgery. 
all of our experiences are quite different. All of our uh, resources are also quite different and our practices can uh, vary from one another. So we really need to rely on each other to kind of get to that highest level of efficiency um, in, a, in a short period of time, but also um, to improve the safety to our patients. So how do you become proficient? I love this quote by Dr. Thomas Swope. Um, I've used it many times. Uh, he is um, uh, a general surgeon and, and is very good words of wisdom. It's first get good, get fast, then, then you get cheap. And so I always encourage surgeons to first perform the surgery so that they can get the best possible result for the patient. Don't worry about how fast they are. Um, that will come later. And also don't worry about how inexpensive you are. For instance, if you need a different tool than the one that's in your hand, don't worry about it being a robotic tool. Ask for a different one and see if that's working better for you. So one of the big keys in getting good is actually having frequent touches. And I personally define that at least two to four cases a week. Um, I think that if you have bigger gaps between individual cases, you'll forget a lot, you'll, excuse me, lose a lot of the progress that you made during your last case. And that is evident um, in, in this example right here, in which you can see here the top 10 surgeons uh, that um, acquired their, excuse me, the top 10% of surgeons who acquired their cases uh, the, the fastest compared to the bottom 90%, those surgeons that were doing, excuse me, cases very frequently, Essentially, within the first 10 cases, they had good operative times compared to those surgeons that were doing them less frequently. Uh, it took 50 or plus more cases. So your learning curve is very dependent on how frequently you are on the council. How do you get fast? Well, first is the experience and the frequent touches. When you get that experience, you're gonna find that you're much faster, but also that experience allows you to develop team dynamics. So the inefficiencies you experience when you're sitting um, at the surgeon's council and not at the patient's bedside um, become less difficult to overcome. And the team will um, understand what you're doing next and also understand what you're asking for because they've, uh, um, they've developed that level of communication with you. Finally, what's important with getting fast is don't always stick to your old habits that you learned laparoscopically. Be open to new ways of doing things. And I have seen many techniques for different procedures in which I've incorporated from other surgeons and I've seen my cases continue to Im improve in time even after 2,000 plus cases I've already performed. Finally, getting cheap. Uh, once you get good and you get fast and you can step back from it with that good experience and say, hey, what else can I do to keep my cases cost effective? For instance, there's um, in gastric sleeves and, and cholecystectomy. I'll frequently I'll only use three robotic arms. The fourth arm is actually covered with a Mayo stand cover, which at my institution is only 50 cents compared to $80 for the drape that goes over the arm. So that's one step. We've also made our back tables quite lean. The other thing is I believe in relying on the technology. An example of that is I feel that the robotic stapler is very reliable and that frequently it allow you to not need or rely on over sewing or uh, staple line reinforcement. Additionally, with um, over time, we've seen robotic instrumentation decrease. And I think with ongoing competition from other surgical platforms, I hope that continues to be the case. And once again, be open to change. Um, be watching other people's videos, be having those discussions with them, and you'll see opportunities to help decrease cost. So what resources are available to the general surgeon who wants to become a total practice robotic surgeon? Well, they're, they, get, they are more and more robust all the time. First off, surgical societies are seeing the importance of the training. Um, this uh, technology is now being incorporated in residencies, but many of us still need to do, go do hands-on courses. There's also many video libraries, either through surgical societies or from individual surgeons, such as myself. I have one on Vimeo, in which I have over 100 surgical videos that are edited and always feel free to visit those. I, I love it when people do and they uh, contact me and ask me questions. Industry support has become more important. They've recognized the importance of, of adequately training surgeons and I think that's gotten much more robust over the years. Um, for, the, for good or for bad, I think social media and these closed groups that we see, I'm actually a moderator and founder of the Robotic Bariatric Collaboration. We have about 2,500 members at this point in time and it is a very congenial environment. 
And there's many others, such as robotic surgical uh, collaboration, uh, International Hernia Club, um, International Hernia Collaborative, and many, many more. My whole thought there is in these closed media groups, we can uh, protect patient privacy, but we can also share videos. We can have discussions what we do on a daily basis. Uh, we can develop important relationships as a mentor or mentee, um, and also uh, participate in data collaboration. And the final thing I would recommend for a surgeon, if you have the capability of videotaping uh, your surgery, please take it home, review it, and you will see yourself doing things that you can feel you can improve upon on your next case. And do not be shy about sharing those with a mentor. Um, I think that's a great way of rapidly improving uh, your skills. Once again, three critical skills in which I think make it uh, a total practice robotic surgeon. Number one is a sonin anastomosis. Well, I do those whether I do a gastric bypass or a colorectal anastomosis. Advanced uh, hernia techniques. Um, I think you can take all those hernia techniques that we do open, and these can mainly be converted to a minimally invasive approach. And so I think that's a huge advance. And I think re surgeons have recognized that since at least 2014 that we can do a very complex hernia surgery um, once we learn these techniques. Incorporation of enhanced imaging, I think that's very important. And I feel that it frequently we're not doing that well. And um, there's little tips and tricks that I've found that really improve my ability to uh, use the, the fluorescent imaging to the benefit of my patients. So the hands-on anastomosis, once again, this is me doing a gastrojejunostomy. You can see me being nice and efficient and exact. The video is sped up for time purposes, but you can see this is very exact. I did many of these and I subsequently end up incorporating that into my colorectal practice. I have not used an EEA stapler since 2013 and I've been hand sewing uh, my right hemicolectomies in addition to that, just because I'm even more confident in a hand sewn anastomosis than a stapled anastomosis. And so far, I think that has been a big improvement. And I also think it's a skill that's readily learned by a general surgeon. The advanced um, hernia surgical techniques, um, as you can see here, this is actually a reef stopa procedure that is done uh, within the retrorectal space. You can see the complex suturing that's occurring, but also the dissection. Once you start learning the basic techniques, which I feel are really the foundation of your experience, then over time you can start adding things rather than IPOM and tapping all hernias, you can start doing tap uh, ventral hernia repairs, the um, ETAP restopa procedures, and finally TAR. I think there's a big advantage in our patients being able to do this, moving, uh, moving these patients almost to an outpatient setting. Uh, my TAR patients essentially stay an average uh, length of stay is only one day. And I see very, very few wound complications and good results with that. Optimizing the imaging. For instance here, we've been told this right here is a bile duct that you see at the edge of the gallbladder. It's because I know how to dose and time my ICG administration to the patient that I have a very low background in the liver. That did not come intuitively. Um, there are some studies showed that increasing the time between administration and surgery helps it leave the liver and concentrate in the biliary tree. Um, but I always dissect anymore and I feel that fluorescent imaging is a big benefit and um, not only in, um, in gallbladder surgery, but once again, you saw me doing it in revisional or for GI surgery and also using it for my leak test, uh, which is a very sensitive test when I do a gastrojejunostomy. As you see here, because of that improved ICG administration and knowing how to utilize this technology, I can clearly protect that bile duct that was really at risk for being injured. So overall, I think being a total practice uh, robotic surgeon is uh, very doable. It's a realistic goal for surgeons, particularly nowadays, in which we have many more resources for the surgeons to uh, learn these skill sets. Um, it uh, will facilitate complex, minimally invasive surgeries, such as you see here, this is a perforated uh, marginal ulcer um, it can be very exact, well-defined, and possible to do. And then also um, us surgeons tend to be innovative and we'll continue to find new ways of doing MIS surgery with a better platform. Um, and surgeons really lead the way here. And we clearly saw that. Um, it was surgeons that led the way with robotic hernia surgery and it will be surgeons that continue to find unique 
uh, ways to use the technology as it continues to get become much more sophisticated. Anyway, once again, I would like to thank you all for uh, listening to my talk and for being invited to this. Yeah, Dr. So Kim, this is, uh, we'll you very do much. all the questions um, and answers at the end of the talk. I wish could have been there today. Talk. Thank you. So let's move uh, to the next topic, which is the role of endoscopic myotomy in the management of gastrointestinal motility disorder by Dr. Andrew Lures. He's assistant professor of surgery at Brown University. So all the talks are virtual talks, and so we'll have question and answer session at the end of the the sessions. Good afternoon, and hello from Providence, Rhode Island. My name is Andrew Lures, and I'm an assistant professor of surgery at the Warren Alpert Medical School, Brown University. I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity Relax. to discuss the role this of causes regurgitation in the management of gastrointestinal motility disorders. I have the following disclosures, none of which are relevant to the content of this talk. Achalasia is an esophageal motility disorder defined by aperistalsis of the esophageal body and failure of the lower esophageal sphincter to relax. This causes regurgitation, heartburn, weight loss, dysphagia, and chest pain. There's a rising prevalence in the United States, and treatment is not curative. The aim of treatment is to eliminate outflow resistance caused by the non-relaxing lower esophageal sphincter. Possible therapeutic options include pharmacologic management, dilation, and surgical myotomy. Pharmacologic treatment includes nitrates and calcium antagonists. These have only temporary and unsatisfactory effects, often with significant side effect. Non-invasive endoscopic treatment includes botulinum toxin, the esophageal balloon dilation. In our opinion, Botox should be reserved only for patients who require temporizing measures as it provides inferior results. Endoscopic pneumatic balloon dilation can be effective with resolution of dysphagia in up to 70% of cases. However, it's associated with a higher risk of esophageal perforation and frequently recurs, requiring multiple treatments and has a lower success rate overall than surgery. The cumulative five-year remission rate is reported at 50 to 70%. Laparoscopic Heller myotomy has long been considered the final solution for esophageal achalasia. However, this technique has limitations and failures, and particularly uh, gastroesophageal reflux, which occurs in approximately 30% of cases after Heller myotomy. This is why it's typically accompanied by an anti-reflux procedure such as a door fund application. Per oral endoscopic myotomy is a relative newcomer to the scene and has uh, been developed in the context of notes surgery. It's an incisionless, minimally invasive endoscopic treatment for esophageal achalasia. In 2010, Anu et al. described the results of this new endoscopic technique. He described it in 17 patients with esophageal achalasia. The results of all patients were excellent with significant decreases in the Eckert dysphagia scores. Seemingly overnight, POEM was embraced and became the primary form of treatment of achalasia in many centers, despite the absence of long-term and follow-up and randomized controlled trials. Only now are we starting to see that data with longer-term data and randomized controlled trials being released. These are demonstrating that POEM is safe and effective in the management of achalasia. Perhaps part of the reason why POEM was so rapidly adopted is that it requires little in the way of instrumentation. This is a list of equipment that we use in our center to perform POEM. It's a standard gastroscope, a transparent cap, either oblique or tapered, a CO2 insufflator, triangle tip knife and coagulation forceps and electrical surgical generator, submucosal solution, either glycerol or saline based with endobacarmine dye, injection needle, and hemostatic clips. Here's a brief video of our technique. The standard gastroscope is entered, uh, inserted into the stomach. The distal extent of our submucosal dissection is determined approximately two to three centimeters from the uh, gastroesophageal junction. 
a mucosal lift is performed with a submucosal lifting solution. This gives us our landing zone as we're carrying our dissection distally past the gastroesophageal junction once we've made our submucosal tunnel. After the lift, the scope is removed, uh, the cap is, is placed onto the end of the scope, and a mucosal lift on the esophagus is made approximately 10 to 15 centimeters proximal to the gastroesophageal junction. Once this lift is performed, the triangle tip knife is inserted and a two centimeter longitudinal mucosotomy is made. This allows us to insert our gastroscope uh, with the cap into the submucosal plane. We then begin our submucosal dissection. We find that, that this is much more easily performed with a hybrid knife allowing both injection of submucosal lift solution and electrocautery with a single device rather than performing this with the triangle tip and injector needle separately. However, certainly uh, both are possible and can be done. Here we're using the hybrid knife injecting submucosal solution and then applying electrocautery to the submucosal plane. The circular fibers are here at the 12 o'clock position, the mucosa at the six o'clock position. As you proceed distally, it's common to encounter relatively large perforating vessels. These should not be divided with the hybrid knife or the TT knife, but should be coagulated with coagulation forceps as if they bleed, they occlude the plane and make progress uh, increasingly challenging. Once the distal extent of your submucosal tunnel has been made, the uh, myotomy is performed. Care should be taken not to make a full thickness injury on the esophagus. This uh, myotomy is carried two to three centimeters past the gastroesophageal junction onto the body of the stomach. Here you can again see the circular fibers at the 12 o'clock position, mucosa is at the six o'clock position. After the myotomy is made, the scope is removed from the submucosal tunnel. Care is taken to inspect the mucosa to, to uh, identify any inadvertent injuries to the mucosa, which should be closed prior to completion. The scope is advanced through the gastroesophageal junction, which is now widely open. Uh, and offers little resistance to the gastroscope. We end the procedure by closing the mucosotomy with the hemostatic clips. The question is, how is POEM compared to the relevant gold standard, Heller myotomy? Well, the data is early. There's very little in the way of randomized controlled trials. In fact, only one study that has been released uh, in 2019 by Werner et al. comparing the two procedures. And the remainder of our data is from relatively low powered observational studies. But the data that we have demonstrates that the safety for both procedures is comparable. When comparing POEM to laparoscopic Heller myotomy, there is no difference in mortality, serious adverse events, perforation, reoperation for complication. And when comparing patient reported outcomes such as dysphagia and possible need for reintervention, no, no difference between POEM and Heller myotomy were identified. Similarly, when we look at man, uh, manometric findings, so similar resolution of lower esophageal pressures is noted with POEM. Reflux is the frequent, most frequently voiced concern for POEM. While the laparoscopic Heller myotomy is often accompanied by a fundoplication, no, this does not occur during a POEM procedure. Observational studies initially demonstrated no difference in effect for six month patient reported heartburn or reflux symptoms. However, the randomized controlled data from the Werner et al. paper uh, demonstrates a higher incidence of reflux esophagitis, uh, higher incidence of patient reported reflux and use of PPIs in the POEM group. However, only the PPI use did achieve statistical significance in this study. Um, as mentioned before, both the door and toupee are typically performed with the heller, and this has been shown to reduce reflux rates and are both equally effective. However, it should be considered that the fundoplication is not without side effect. And it's interesting to note that there is really no study that has included this as an outcome um, when comparing POEM and heller myotomy. Uh, there are no studies that look at uh, bloating, rectal fat flatulence, or inability to vomit. Uh, or belch as an outcome when comparing the, the two procedures. 
up to 82% of patients undergo endoscopic management of achalasia prior to being referred to, to surgery for uh, treatment. This is despite the literature, uh, growing body of literature that uh, suggests that endoscopic therapies are neither effective nor durable. When considering laparoscopic hyalurmyotomy, it's been well documented that those who have had prior endoscopic therapies do experience an increase not only in perforations, but also other intraoperative difficulties and postoperative complications. They also have a higher treatment failure rate. These complications are best explained by the difficult hiatal and mediastinal dissection and, and in, those, uh, in those patients who've had prior endoscopic therapies. Anecdotally, patients who've had prior endoscopic therapies have a notably different submucosal dissection plane. This plane is often obliterated and it's difficult to confidently assess. There is no data on the effects of therapy uh, or prior endoscopic therapy on poem outcomes but it's our anecdotal experience that these trends hold true and is certainly an area that is ripe for further investigation. Early on in our offerings of POEM, we have avoided uh, performing POEM on, on patients who've had significant number of prior endoscopic interventions or prior Heller myotomy. This, uh, the po offering POEM after a failed Heller is perhaps where this procedure shines best. Uh, the other options for treatment after a failed Heller have marginal success rates. The uh, pneumatic dilation in patients who have failed prior Heller myotomy have success rates ranging between 50 and 80 percent. However, up to 45 percent of patients need another procedure within two years. Repeat surgical myotomy is reportedly more successful uh, with approximately 73 to 89 percent of patients having technically successful case with clinical resolution. However, it's a technical cha technically challenging case because of adhesions and fibrosis in the mediastinum, and it's associated with a higher risk of gastrointestinal perforation. POEM has been shown to be technically successful in these cases in up to 98% of patients who have previously undergone a Heller myotomy, uh, and the clinical response rates appear to be similar of that uh, to repeat Heller myotomy but you do need to re-enter a uh, reoperative field, um, uh, or excuse me, while you need to re-enter a, a reoperative field with the Heller myotomy, that can be avoided with the POEM procedure. This seems to me to be uh, one of the uh, reasons to have this tool in your armamentarium. Perhaps why, uh, uh, one of the biggest reasons to uh, surgeons have historically avoided this procedure is the perceived learning curve. It is a challenging dissection to learn initially. Um, however, uh, despite um, data to suggest that uh, a significant number of cases are needed to, to gain efficiency, our experience has shown um, that perhaps this is slightly less or probably around 20 cases or so to become efficient in the OR uh, with this procedure. And there is emerging data uh, to support that claim. Um, but the really the, the only well-powered study that looked at this is the Patel study uh, that uh, demonstrated approximately 40 cases to gain efficiency in the operating room and 60 cases to achieve mastery. There are simulated models, mainly uh, porcine esophagus models, uh, which can assist surgeons looking to learn this technique. And this is where I start to sound like a late night infomercial. The, the real reason and the selling point for me on learning this procedure uh, and offering to my patients is that it has multiple uses. The same technique can be used in the treatment of gastroparesis in a G poem where a submucosal plane is made uh, at the lesser curvature of the stomach and the pylorus is uh, divided. Um, and this, uh, it can be particularly useful in patients who've had multiple intra-abdominal operations presenting with gastroparesis. Uh, and again, it allows you to avoid a reoperative plane and offer these patients a drainage procedure, which is uh, very effective. Um, the data on this procedure is uh, even younger than uh, POEM for achalasia, and it still remains to be seen how eff efficacious it is and what the long-term results are. Um, but again, anecdotally, in the patients that we've offered this to, uh, their uh, quality of life has improved substantially uh, and they're able to eat more normally. Um, and a, another emerging 
topic for this uh, technique is the Z poem for Zanker's diverticulum. This is a little bit different in that you're not, um, uh, as far as the anatomy is concerned, and there are some concerns that have been raised for the procedure. It's very early on and, and it's, um, it's kind of in its infancy, um, but it'll be interesting to see where that procedure goes. So in conclusion, I think uh, you know, poem is, uh, or endoscopic myotomy is uh, something that every minimally invasive surgeon should have in their toolbox. It allows you to offer treatments that would be otherwise very technically challenging to patients, um, uh, particularly in reoperative settings, such as a failed Heller myotomy uh, or the multiply operated on abdomen with gastroparesis. Um, the learning curve is low. And it seems that though the at least two year uh, data is uh, encouraging, certainly further data is needed to assess um, long term viability of these procedures and quality of life, particularly as it uh, centers around uh, reflux. Uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to uh, discuss this, and uh, I hope uh, Minneapolis is enjoyable for all. Uh, sorry I can't be with you in person. Take care. Hello, this is Rohan Jairaja, and I'm really honored to be here today uh, to talk to you about the evaluation and role of robotic surgery in the management of pancreatic cancer. It's a great honor for me to speak to this esteemed audience regarding this, and I'm so sorry I couldn't be there in person. A few disclosures. I'm a consultant for Certex and a consultant for Angiodynamics. None of those um, uh, None of those companies or their products are being talked about during this presentation. So what are the challenges with pancreatic surgery in general? Well, you know, things are tough when you get close to large structures like the portal vein, the vena cava, the hepatic artery, the SMA, or the aorta. And with pancreatic resections, we're close to all of those structures. We also have a type of surgery that requires a resection and then an anastomosis. And I always tell my patients, the Whipple is actually three surgeries in one, right? You've got a stomach operation, a pancreas operation, and a bile duct operation. Um, there are few other surgeries that take this kind of different organs um, uh, and have need connections uh, at the end of all of this uh, challenging resection. How do we really teach this, especially when we come to a new technology like robotics? Well, we have to remember that we want the faculty and the trainees to learn together, which is one of my pet peeves when I started robotics was, how do you teach others while you yourself are learning and how do we make the curves such that the faculty curve occurs first and then the trainee curves occurs after that? We really want these curves to be parallel or together in order to not frustrate everyone around you, um, especially when you have things like fellowship training programs. So within this, we also have the challenges of the instrument. So we have a challenging surgery, but we also have a challenging instrument. And you have to be on the instrument, i.e. the robot, enough to know what the instrument is all about. You have to be able to click it. You have to be able to finger clutch. You have to be able to do all these things. It's sort of like playing the piano. It's really practice, and an instrument takes practice. I'm a sort of mediocre pianist, but the more I'm on it, the better I am. 
Um, you have to have enough volume to do this often enough. And this is tough if you just have HPV cases, because there's just not a lot of pure HPV volume that can be done on a robotic platform. Um, and so I use other operations to augment my experience on the robot. Um, you also have to be good at the surgery itself, for example, the Whipple procedure, and have experience on the tool itself. And really what this comes down to with the patient in the center of this Venn diagram is you've got to have experience on the robot. You've got to have experience with the surgery itself. The mode of difficulty or the extent of difficulty of the surgery itself does impact on how you're going to approach this. And then how do you teach and learn at the same point? There's so many variables in this. It's sort of like operating on a cirrhotic for a cancer, right? There's also the cirrhosis, but there's also the cancer. Here you've got the robot and you've got the underlying disease. So in my mind, there are a few key principles, right? You've got to be on the robot enough that you know the instrument. You've got to be experienced enough with the surgery that you know the technical aspect. And to me, when you're on the robot, in order to train, you want to use all of your arms of the robot. So to me, I want to use all three arms. Now let's just kind of walk through the steps of a Whipple. So when I do a Whipple robotically, I, it's backwards because usually for an open Whipple, I do a Catal brush and then I approach the S and V and I've got everything dissected out before I start transecting. With a robotic Whipple, I transect the uh, stomach first, then I'm looking straight at the neck of the pancreas and I create this tunnel using my right gastroepiploic vein to find the superior mesenteric vein. GDA, ligated, then transected above. Next, oftentimes I won't even create the tunnel. I'll just divide as I go along the S and V. And I've actually started to adopt this open to rather than spending a lot of time creating a tunnel in, a, in, in cases where it's somewhat difficult. I just create the tunnel as I go along. Robotically, I leave the bile duct till the end, actually, because it's sort of, I don't like bile uh, spilling onto the field here. And robotically, we'll take the uh, proximal jejunum and then flip it around uh, as it comes around. And I actually think the uncinate is one of the hardest things to do robotically in my mind. I find that coker and the uncinate a little bit challenging. And then the reconstruction, typically we'll do the Bloomgart reconstruction. Uh, this is with usually a tour of silk on an MH needle. And then the inner layer is going to be uh, fibroproline. Um, on the robot, we'll use a monocrole, just it's a little bit easier to handle. And then the bile duct, I used to use a V-lock, but actually had a couple of strictures that I think are related to the, to the suture with the bob. And so I have moved to use a monocrole also with the bile duct. A lot of people interrupt this. I personally run everything I possibly can. And then the last thing we do is use a falciform flap to wrap the pancreas itself. And these are my own illustrations, so I didn't uh, copy them from somebody else. And I really hope that these help put things in perspective. I mentioned using all arms. Uh, I think that this is one of the most amazing things for me to see is even with the most experienced uh, robotic surgeons, when you watch their videos, they have um, a arm that's just sitting there. And to me, that's really just a waste of an extra arm. In fact, I would like the robotics companies to come up with um, a total of five arms on the robot, one for the camera and four to work with, so that we can click, click, use both arms. And the reason is, if you think about an organist using their feet and both hands, I don't see why we can't use our feet uh, in doing this. It would be so lovely to have all, uh, to have an, all four usable arms. And this is a paper that we published uh, with one of our fellows talking about how to train on the robot using dual console and all three arms that are present on the robot at this point. And we really uh, wanted to try to present an algorithm for training robotically. And this is what we came up with. I know this is a little small, so I apologize, but 
you know, we put the faculty at the console, trainee at bedside initially, just to learn to deal with things like collisions and instrument exchanges and manage emergencies at the bedside, should that be the case. That's sort of for one case. Then what we do is we have the faculty on arm one and four, this is XI, and give the trainee arm three. And so this is now we're working together. And so like laparoscopy, we can work together and flip back and forth such that as the trainee shows proficiency, we give the trainee arm one and four, and I take arm three. Now what that does is it allows you to really have um, a graduation of responsibility on the robot and your fellow or trainee can show you that they can do things safely without wandering around in space or injuring structures. Also what this does is honestly within about three cases we can get a resident at a you know third or fourth year level uh, to do the mobilization and actually do a miss and fund application. Now, what that means is that they need to be able to suture, which I'll talk about in a minute, but it still is um, a fairly remarkable way to get to the point. So what have we found? Well, we published this paper too, actually with one of our medical students who's just fantastic, especially at statistics. And we use a technique called the CUSUM, C-U-S-U-M analysis. And what this does is it takes the mean of your operating times and then looks at the variance from that mean. It's a really nice way to look at a learning curve rather than just looking at operating times. And I'm a sort of a, a weirdo in that I do um, many types of surgery, not just uh, HPV. And so we looked at the um, comparison of other surgeries and compared those, those to HPV procedures. And we used robotic Heller uh, as a comparison and tried to see what the learning curve looked like. So this is distal pancreatectomy, and what I, I wanted to just explain this learning curve a little bit. So you can see this rise, and then a relative plateau, and then a drop. So in Kusum technology, what this means is this is gaining uh, expertise, this is plateauing, and this is mastery. So really, we look at that first inflection point as when you've gained, um, you're really very good at doing the case. And then the second inflection point is when you actually not only are good, but you are an expert or a master at this. And for the robotic distal pancreatectomy, interestingly, it took 11 of these cases before we got to really very comfortable, good practice, and then 47 before we started to see um, absolute uh, technical um, mastery. Robotic pancreatic duodenectomy. So using this technique of three arms and um, using other operations to gain expertise on the tool, the robot, and also doing open pancreatic duodenectomies during this time, we found that the first inflection was at 17, interestingly enough, and the second inflection was at 51. And again, actually, when you look at the logistic regression, this looks actually really, really nice. So I, I wanted to point this out because many other studies have shown that um, sort of that first mastery usually occurs around 60 pancreatic adudinectomies, and we think that this quicker mastery is because of the experience gained through other cases. Well, look at the at the Kusum curves for robotic Heller, five to gain expertise and 18 to gain mastery. So really it was almost a, um, a quick learning curve for the robotic Heller. And um, this is really interesting, I think. Um, and part of this is if you look at this, the types of dissections that are required for these, this is you know, a vascular dissection and then stapling. This is not only vascular dissection and stapling, but also suturing. This is actually just cutting, right? And I will do hellas often without a wrap. Um, and so this is where you get um, you know, changes in uh, expertise or your Kusum curves. 
So our conclusion is that robotic pancreatic adudinectomy can in fact uh, be learnt, but the slope tends to depend on experience in the, in the surgery and experience with other robotic procedures too. And my advice is, gosh, be cautious because there's plenty of data out there. Unfortunately, that early quick um, progression to especially pancreatic adudinectomy is, uh, can result in really major outcome issues, um, including mortality on the table. So we really don't want that to happen. We want to be safe. And I would start with a low hanging fruit. And actually distal pank is a really lovely way to go because you can just do stapling for this with dissection. There's, I would do procedures with no suturing. Hydal hernia procedures are nice ones where you can start to suture, but you're in a safe space. Uh, you're not too close to major structures, uh, except the aorta, and you're fairly far away from that. And then I actually found esophagectomy to be a beautiful tool because I do sort of a modified approach where I bring the specimen out through the abdomen through a mini laparotomy and do the suturing on the on the belly. It was, it was a beautiful way to use robotics. And then, you know, I would gradually add things like suturing, complex dissections, and uh, dissecting around key structures. I hope this helps as you progress through your uh, practice in the role of robotics in your uh, treatment of pancreatic uh, surgery. Um, I think overall that uh, it's a fantastic tool, uh, but I think you have to make it look good. It's like a Thank brilliant you piano. You know, if you've got a Bosendorfer, it doesn't matter how beautiful the tool is if you can't operation. play it. And also so I hope this helps a little bit in the way that I think about robotics and practice. training on it. Thank you so talk, much very good for having feedback. me, and again, I apologize that so I'm not So now moving there. to the, the next you. topic will be adopting new robotic technologies for hernia repair by Dr. Marco Andrea Giorgi, who is the Assistant Professor of Surgery at the Warren Alpert Medical School of Brown University. Thank you for inviting me to talk about new surgical treatment. Hello, and thank you so much for having me to present here today. Uh, my name is Dr. Georgie. I'm an assistant professor of surgery at the Warren Alper Medical School of Brown University, Providence, Rhode Island. And today we're going to talk about new robotic technologies uh, for hernia repair. This is my only disclosure, which is not relevant for this talk. So we've been doing hernia surgery for more than 100 years, but regardless of that, we really haven't figured out which is the best way to approach hernias, uh, defects, especially for ventral hernias, for moderate and large uh, hernias overall. This is the outline of my talk. We're going to talk about a little bit about mesh position, mesh overlap. We're going to talk about the robotic platform and what advantages it can give surgeons and then we're going to talk about uh, how to translate some of the surgeries that we've been doing open or laparoscopic for a while to robotic and what is the current data. So for mesh position, really a lot of confusing uh, factors. There's a lot of positions in the abdominal wall where we can place the mesh. And we can put it in an onlay, as an inlay, as a retromuscular sublay, preperitoneal, or even intraperitoneal. Some data uh, out there in the world. Uh, this is a paper from 2016. It looked at um, basically a pairwise meta-analysis and a systematic review of onlay, inlay, sublay, and underlay, and they identified around 6,000 patients. And they looked, it's, it showed that sublay may actually be one of the best repairs because it has a lower risk of recurrence of surgical site infections. And the, out of the four treatments, uh, the probability test shows that it can be one of the best uh, operations to perform. These are some of the randomized control trials uh, that uh, compare sublay or retroactus uh, versus onlay mesh repair, and also for 
uh, IPOM or intraperitoneal only mesh, so a mesh that has been placed inside uh, the peritoneal cavity. Um, overall, all these studies show that um, sublay may be somewhat of a better repair, but unfortunately, there is no phenomenal uh, studies uh, out there in the literature because it's so hard to perform them. And you can see that again, uh, this slide with the retromuscular uh, sublay repair where the mesh is above the posterior rectus fascia and right below the muscle, which is well vascularized. Overlap. Um, this is a study that has been presented a few years ago at the first Italian consensus conference for laparoscopic ventral incisional hernia repairs. Uh, while unfortunately, because there's not a lot of good studies, uh, we can't really take home some definite um, guidelines, recommendations, the conference uh, talked about a minimum overlap that is recommended about three centimeters, while the ideal overlap should be about five centimeters, especially for larger defects. And of course, the larger the defect, the more stress there is at the fixation points. Uh, if you have multiple hernias, you should really consider them as a single entity, as a single pathology, as a single problem. So you should consider all of them when you think about your overlap and not just about the biggest one that you have. Other, other um, studies that have been um, done and they looked at the proper mesh overlap. Um, this is a, a nice review article and, and looked at 95 articles, um, 111 study populations. And again, it looked at open ventral hernias and laparoscopic ventral hernias. And it showed that three centimeters should be really the minimum. But when you go on top above five centimeters, uh, that's when you have the best overlap that you can get. So a little bit about the advantages of the robotic platform. Uh, as of now, there is really just one commercially available by Intuitive, um, which is pretty well known. Uh, the advantages are that uh, with a 3D camera, you can really have 3D uh, visualization. So as you would have in open surgery, uh, compared to straight sticks, which is usually what we have for laparoscopic surgery, you can have wrist articulation, which you can mimic as you know as much as possible your movement of the mov the movement of the surgeon uh, as they would be for an open operation. You can have energy instruments in both hands. So if you're doing laparoscopic surgery, you just have the bobby on one side or the scissors hooked up to the cautery. You can have a bipolar instrument on your left hand, and you can have a monopolar scissor, uh, for example, on your right hand. The ergonomics are definitely one of the biggest points. Uh, while you have to stand oftentimes um, for laparoscopic surgery for very long times, and you may have to be in awkward positions while suturing the abdominal wall, uh, you're really sitting at the console for robotic surgery, so ergonomics are greatly improved. Also, uh, there is a much improved suturing and for intracorporeal um, you know, technique. So while it's hard even to teach residents and fellows to suture intracorporeally, and that's one of the reasons why oftentimes residents want to go into another fellowship, it's very intuitive uh, to suture intracorporeally robotically because you really mimic what you would do open. Um, there can be a finer dissection uh, because the view is magnified, it's 3D, and you have more control. So in difficult anatomic areas, the robot can actually give you an advantage. And another thing is that as a surgeon, you control the camera so that you can focus on whatever you want without ever risking the camera to slide or uh, not keeping the horizon. So maintaining control over the surgery overall. This is what it looks like. You can see on the left side uh, of the slide, you have the tower. In the middle, you have the robotic platform, which are four arms. Uh, this is the uh, XI model of the, for the intuitive Da Vinci. And then on the right side, you have the surgeon's console where you can sit down and then you have um, your your view, 3D view up top with the pedals down below to control your instruments and the energy. So these are the robotic techniques which were routinely performed nowadays in the United States and also in Europe, uh, IPOM, TAP, ETAP, or TAR. Uh, some of them are literally the same iteration of laparoscopic repairs, so just translated to robotic. And then we have some of the complex, uh, more uh, complex repairs that are, came up uh, in, the, in, in surgery in the last few years. So IPOM, a pretty straightforward operation, is basically kind of the same thing that we do laparoscopically. It's an intraperitoneal only mesh placement. It's the entry level operation. Uh, the, your intraperitoneal, so you have to perform lysis of adhesions. Uh, the sac may or may not be excised. There are different iterations of this technique where the sac can be completely left alone and plicated, 
or you can excise the sac, um, making it an IPOM plus procedure. Uh, the hernia defect is usually plicated, the fascia schools with suture, and then the mesh, uh, which is usually a mesh that is coated because it's in contact with the intervertebral content and suture in place. Compared to laparoscopic, uh, you don't tack the mesh using a tacker, so you save the cost of a tacker and usually use sutures. And this is usually what it looks like. So we can see here a small size uh, hernia, which is a ventral hernia with some momentum that is incarcerated. We use the monopolar scissors to do lysis of adhesions. Um, if you have bowel, of course, you have to be careful. And then the fascia is sutured uh, by using uh, a no barbed suture. Different surgery and different preferences. A permanent suture can be used. This is actually an absorbable suture like a PDS. The hernia sac is plicated. This is done to prevent a uh, risk of seroma formation, which is uh, uh, usually what can happen during laparoscopic surgery if you leave the hernia sac and the hernia defect open. Then at the end, uh, we use a coated uh, macroporous mesh that is going to be sutured in place. You can see how the robotic platform uh, really lets the surgeon uh, suture on top of the abdominal wall uh, relatively easy. Uh, the next procedure, which is re usually, usually a step up from the IPOM, it's a TAP procedure, so a transabdominal preperitoneal approach. Uh, the concept is kind of the same, but you actually build a peritoneal flap, similar to what we do in the inguinal space. Um, where we, the mesh will be covered by the peritoneum. So you don't have to use a coated mesh. So the cost of the mesh is usually lower compared to a coated mesh. Uh, the pitfall of this procedure is that sometimes can be very hard uh, to create a peritoneal flap because uh, the peritoneum can be very adhesed to the posterior rectus fascia or to other muscles in the abdominal wall. And so can th there can be a lot of tears that need to be fixed. Otherwise, the mesh can be, become in contact with the bowel and create some problems. So it's a little bit more challenging, uh, but also uh, pretty uh, nice results. And this is how it looks like. You can see that the hernia sac is dissected from within the hernia and preserved um, because the sac will actually help with the peritoneal flap closure. It's very important to keep going uh, beyond the hernia so that we have a nice overlap uh, without risking to running out of space. The hernia defect is plicated and closed in the same way as with the IPOM. And different kinds of mesh can be placed in this area. Um, for this particular procedure, we use a polyester uh, self-fixating mesh, uh, but a macroporous polypropylene uh, can be used without any issues at all. And then at the end, the peritoneum uh, is closed back up uh, with a running barbed suture. Uh, this particular technique actually show like a canal suture, which kind of helps hide the barbed suture uh, within the peritoneum uh, folds itself so that it doesn't uh, come in contact with the bowel. This is now the time for the more complex hernia repairs. Uh, so this is the famous ETAP or Enhanced View uh, Total Exabertoneal Retrorectus Mesh Repair, which is really the equivalent of a reef stopper repair just done robotically um, with an enhanced view because we get access directly into the retrorectus space via an OptiView um, technique. 
and then we insufflate this area without really going into the intraperitoneal cavity as much as possible. Um, after the ipsilateral rectal space has been dissected out, which is usually almost avascular, then the posterior rectus fascia medially, where it fuses with the anterior rectus fascia and the lineal by is, is incised. We get access to the preperitoneal space uh, and we leave the linea alba and usually with some diastasis anteriorly, which will look uh, apically or you know, superiorly on your screen. We get access to the contralateral posterior rect rectus fascia, which will be incised as well, and so that we can get access to the contralateral retrorectus space. Uh, this dissection is carried over all the way to the semilunaris line, and then this is where the mesh will be. Compared to the open uh, procedure, uh, usually the retrorectus fascia is not stitched back together as long as the peritoneum uh, it's intact in the midline and they can give you pretty good results because you can have a very big overlap and the mesh is in contact with a nice uh, vascularized tissue like the muscle and away from the bowel. This is usually where the mesh is placed and how it looks like. Uh, the transverse abdominus release is a posterior component separation. is the natural continuation of an ETEP or a posterior, um, or, or, sorry, a retrorectus um, hernia repair. Uh, at the level of the similar nares, uh, at that point, the transverse abdominus muscle will be incised up top, or uh, the transversalis fascia will be incised uh, down below, and we get access to the preperitoneal space. Uh, and the dissection keeps going laterally as long as you want, all the way to the psoas muscle, if you really want. And that will get you um, a flap, which is going to be a retrorectus fascia flap medially, and then laterally transversalis fascia, you know, plus or, uh, peritoneum plus or minus transversalis fascia, and it will give you a very uh, big space where you can put your mesh, and you can get a mobilization up to 10 centimeters or so from each side. Uh, this is a posterior component separation, and also to be noted that the neurovascular bundle at the edge uh, of the similar line of the rectus muscle laterally is also preserved. And this is how it looks like. Uh, and I'm going to show you a video of actually both procedures uh, done at the same time. So an ETAP that will continue with an uh, hemilateral uh, TAR, a transverse abdominus release for a defect. Uh, that was a little bit too large just for a retrorectus repair. This is the CAT scan, uh, which shows uh, a midline recurrent defect. This is the port placement uh, with the robot, so you, we just need three uh, eight millimeter robotic ports. Uh, this is the access to the directly into the retrorectus space. You can see fascia below and muscle up top. The space is dissected out with cautery and bluntly and is insufflated with CO2 until the robotic platform uh, can be docked. And you can see it's almost an avascular plane. This is a robotic platform that has been docked and you can see immediately the posterior rectus fascia on the same side is incised, uh, exposing the preperitoneal space also another advantage of the robotic platform is you can see here that if you have a mentor or an assistant, they can point out things uh, on the console directly. Uh, you can see up top in white that the linea alba is stretched out and is diastatic. And then there is a darker contour, which uh, shows the contralateral posterior retrorectus uh, fascia. And by cutting it, we get access to the contralateral posterior retrorectus space. Then the hernia sac is uh, exposed. Uh, Interperitoneal view is achieved to make sure that there is no bowel uh, so that we don't make any enterotomies or any injuries. Oftentimes, the hernia sac is actually uh, cut so that it will be easier to plicate uh, anteriorly at the end of the procedure. You can see here the dissection all the way to the same lunaris line, but the posterior layer uh, is actually as pretty under, under a lot of tension. And because of that, we continue uh, with a component separation with a tar on, on the uh, contralateral side. You can see here that the uh, tendinous part of the transverse abdominis is released, and that this is below the arcuate line, so a bottom-up component separation with tar, where below you'll have the peritoneum transversalis fascia, 
and uh, up top you'll have the transversus muscle which is uh, nicely exposed here uh, it's very important to drop the transversus abdominis muscle anteriorly which will look superiorly uh, on your screen and you can see now that uh, the posterior layer actually comes together nicely the posterior layer is closed with an absorbable suture in a uh, running fashion. And this is where the, where, where the mesh will be. And then uh, anteriorly, we close the rest of the abdominal wall uh, and the hernia. So the hernia will be plicated together uh, with the diastasis and the linea alba to restore, um, your, your, to restore your linea alba completely. You can see here, if you have a big defect, um, how the hernia sac can be used uh, and be grabbed to actually be plicated. If you don't do that, uh, then you just have subcutaneous tissue, which can fall apart and can be a little harder to placate. And you can see here the restoration of the linea alba. Then the space is measured. This can be done robotically or laparoscopically. At this point, it's mostly up to surgeon preference and then a macroporous uh, polypropylene soft mesh is placed in this area. Um, the choice of mesh is mostly because it's very uh, pliable, it's easy to, um, to be placed, and also the macroporosity prevents um, or helps you preventing uh, infection somewhat. So this is the data that we have nowadays uh, for the ETAP technique. Uh, it's very recent data. There is not a lot yet, uh, but more is coming out. Uh, and the, the data shows that it's a safe technique, it's an effective technique, but there is no, no long-term uh, follow-up as of now. For the TAR, uh, there has been two great studies that have compared open versus uh, robotic, actually um, transverse abdominus release. And the, while the um, infection rates are comparable, uh, open compared to robotic, 6% versus 7%. The more morbidity is actually minimal uh, for the robotic TAR, and that's understandable given the fact that you trade a midline incision compared to three or six uh, very small uh, eight millimeter uh, incisions. The systemic complications are actually impressive um, for the robotic part because they're 0% compared to 17% or so for open. The overall morbidity is, is cut in half with a robotic approach, and also the hospital day is decreased dramatically for two to three days in average compared to six to nine days with the open approach. So this is a very hot topic, especially for patients related outcomes, and uh, there is a lot of data that will come up in the next few years. So in summary, hernia surgery is not as easy as it seems. Unfortunately, there is not great studies that tell us exactly what to do when to do it. Patient selection will always be critical and also technique selection. Uh, it's unclear though which technique is optimal for what kind of defects. Uh, retrorectus repair and TAR uh, seem to be some of the best procedures that we have in our, um, you know, in our armamentarium for the moderate or large hernias. Uh, robotic um, complex hernia is a new and a hot topic and it seemed that it may improve outcomes for certain patients when technically appropriate. Um, hernia surgeons should consider all approaches, uh, MIS, open, robotic, um, whatever, really, as long as we tailor them to the individual patients and we have a good patient selections. But tracking outcomes in the future uh, is gonna be extremely important. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present and I'll be glad to take any questions. Thank you for inviting me to talk about new surgical treatments for GERD disease. Uh, there are so many therapies available for treatment of GERD. And so 
want to kind of explain why that is, and then we'll talk about a lot of the more popular treatments. So as you all know, GERD is a very prevalent and common disease. Uh, it's one of the most common digestive diseases in the U.S. and many other countries around the world. It's extremely prevalent within the population, and so that means that there is a very large market share in terms of treatment of GERD disease. And so many pharmaceutical and device companies have attempted to do their best to stake something in this uh, treatment of GERD because there are so many medical dollars available for the treatment of GERD. And so acid suppression has really become the first step in treatment of heartburn. I think this is largely driven by pharmaceutical companies. You can see it's one of the most frequently prescribed uh, medications, PPIs, and it's a significant amount of medical dollars spent on um, these medications. In fact, they're available over the counter as well, and so we have many patients self-prescribing for heartburn. Problem with that is that it's suppressing the acid um, and masking some of the symptoms, but not really treating the underlying disease. And so what that means is that you can continue to have progression of disease on PPI therapy. In fact, after 20 years of PPI therapy, 28% of patients will progress to Barrett's esophagus despite daily treatment with PPI use. And so this is largely because the lower esophageal sphincter is incompetent and we're still having reflux of bile, food, and even acid that's causing damage to the esophagus. And so as surgeons, we understand that treatment of GERD really is centered around the anatomical restoration of the lower esophageal sphincter. So that takes us to how do we do that? Well, there's a few important parts of this, and the first important aspect for restoring lower esophageal sphincter competency uh, is repairing the hiatal hernia. I think almost all reflux surgeons would agree that there's always some kind of hiatal laxity um, and migration of the lower esophagus into the chest. And so for any kind of robust repair, the hiatal hernia must be fixed. The second part of the operation is reconstructing the valve. And this is where a lot of the device companies and new devices come into play in terms of how do we re reconstruct that valve. Um, and so the first device I'll talk about is this um, ring of beads here called the Lynx device or magnetic sphincter augmentation. And this is a device, if you look at the right here, it's a string of titanium beads with a magnetic core that stays closed when nothing is happening in terms of swallowing. And when then, when food is projected through it, the, the beads separate to allow the food to go down and then the beads come back together after the food has passed into the stomach. Um, as you can see here on the left, we now know that the hiatus must be closed and the esophagus must be mobilized into the abdomen in order for this to be an effective operation. When the Lynx device was first placed, it was placed without hiatal hernia repair, and that led to a very low rate of GERD um, treatment. And so we now know that that's an important part of the procedure. Absolute contraindications for this are patients that require MRI for any kind of reason with uh, that MRI is greater than 1.5 Teslas. Um, and then any patients with allergies to um, certain metals. Has good, has shown good outcomes. It, you he, see here, this is a study comparing links to BID PPIs, significantly increased improvement in clinical outcomes in terms of clinical symptom improvement. Um, you can see that links far outperforms PPI use. And then again, looking at pH normalization, um, most patients with links will achieve pH normalization as compared to patients on PPI use. And when we look at longer outcomes, these are probably the longest outcomes we have with links. Um, at a mean nine-year follow-up, 80% of patients are off PPIs, and almost all patients, again, have uh, pH normalization. Risks are fairly low, um, not many removals and no erosions in this group. Erosions have significantly decreased since we learned that you cannot put the links tight around the esophagus. Initially, when this procedure was um, started and the device was first used, 
the Lynx device was placed very snugly around the esophagus. And what that did was it led to some, uh, a non, a not non-significant amount of esophageal erosion. And since we learned that the Lynx device should be placed very loosely around the esophagus, much, much lower risk of erosion. Another um, procedure that we um, are seeing more commonly now is the transoral incisionless fundoplication. Um, this is a video showing how the device works because it's a little bit hard for me to explain without the video. Um, so let me play that for you now. Into the stomach. The stomach is inflated and the endoscope is advanced and retroflexed so that it is looking up at the gastroesophageal junction. The valve reconstruction starts with the engagement of the helical retractor at the gastroesophageal junction. Then tissue is retracted into the tissue mold as the esophagus device is rotated, wrapping the fundus toward the lesser curvature of the stomach. A small hiatal hernia can be reduced and the intra-abdominal length of the esophagus can be restored using suction built into the device. The trigger handle deploys a pair of non-absorbable polypropylene H fasteners above the GEJ to oppose the fundus to the esophagus. This retract, wrap, oppose process is repeated in specific locations to ultimately create an omega-shaped valve. Approximately 20 serosa fuse fasteners are placed during the procedure to recreate physiological anatomy and help prevent refluxate from entering the esophagus. Studies. So as you can see here, this is essentially an endoscopic way to create a partial 270 degree wrap. Um, the device company, when this initially came out, again, was trying to support this use as only an endoscopic procedure and not needing to fix small hiatal hernias, that this device would somehow fix those hiatal hernias. What we found pretty soon uh, was that without fixing the hiatal hernia again and only doing the TIF procedure, you could not have good treatment of GERD disease. So here you can see only TIF by itself, you get 40% pH normalization. What you need to do is actually do the hiatal hernia repair um, and, then all, and then the TIF for, to achieve a high rate of pH normalization. Um, and so, you know, we are seeing a lot of gastroenterologists that are still doing the TIF only and patients are coming to see us after that um, with recurrent or persistent GERD and now um, wanting a revisional operation. Um, not too terrible uh, to operate on these patients, but again, not ideal. Better to have treated them appropriately from the beginning. So um, what this is now being called is the com combined TIF procedure, and that is what the device company is advocating as well, is that these procedures be performed concomitantly with a hiatal hernia repair. And so should there should be a surgeon involved um, when patients are being evaluated for this procedure as well. And then some procedures that have recently lost favor over the last couple of years, um, two different procedures that essentially are trying to cause fibrosis at the GE junction to restore the lower esophageal sphincter. The first one on the left, the ARMS procedure, anti-reflux mucosectomy, um, essentially uh, in retroflex, the mucosa is resected around about 270 degrees around the GE junction uh, to, and this is thought to cause scarring and fibrosis there. Uh, and similarly on the right, the strata procedure uh, where an RFA balloon is placed at the GE junction to cause injury to the mucosa and allow fibrosis and tightening. Um, in the theory that this would allow for a lower esophageal sphincter competency. As you can imagine, these procedures do increase the, can, can cause strictures and increase the risk of other pathology at the GE junction, um, and so has somewhat fallen out of favor uh, for that reason. And then that leaves us with kind of what most people think about when we talk about anti-reflux surgery which is the floppiness and fundoplication, a technique that was really kind of perfected 
in the 80s. Um, this is the procedure that is has the stigma of many side effects and thus discourages many patients and referring providers from sending patients to see a surgeon about anti-reflux surgery because there is so much stigma associated with the Nissen fundoplication. And it, it is true, you know, with the Nissen fundoplication, there is a significant side effect profile of bloating, um, dysphagia, increased flatulence, inability to retch. So many patients are afraid to come in to be evaluated for anti-reflux surgery because of what providers or um, even patients online have been saying. And so in the reflux community, reflux surgery community, I think most of us have actually moved away from the Nissen fundoplication and are doing more partial fundoplications now, whether that's a toupee fundoplication or a door, uh, anterior door fundoplication. And this is because these partial fundoplications are actually associated with a much, much lower side effect profile, but can show um, similar efficacy in terms of GERD treatment. And so here you can see a randomized control study, a uh, large group of patients in this instance for partial, partial fundoplication, less um, equal efficacy, similar morbidity, less dysphagia, less ga gas blow. And again, you see we this um, the FART <laughs> study, you have a less, much lower risk of increased flatulence after the partial fundoplication. And so for me, my preference is uh, partial fundoplication with hiatal hernia repair in these patients. Um, I think it's a very good operation. I think it does achieve um, good, great clinical outcomes. I do tell patients that if they have PPI responsive disease, they have about an 85 to 95% chance of stopping their PPIs after the surgery. And in that 15, uh, 5 to 15% of patients that don't, aren't able to stop their PPI use, they still have significantly better clinical outcomes and symptom relief after surgery, um, despite not being able to stop the PPI use. And so if a patient comes to me, they want a Lynx device, I'm happy to put it in and hide all hernia repair. Um, I don't push links. Uh, I think a lot of patients don't like the idea of putting a foreign object in. Some people do. They don't like the idea of a fundoplication. Um, so I leave it to the patient because the links, to me, links and partial fundoplication are equivalent procedures. TIF, again, is a partial fundoplication. And so if a patient wants that, that's fine. We will do a hiatal hernia repair and a TIF. Um, and so, you know, talking about advanced technologies and other things that add to anti-reflux surgery, I know this session talks a lot about robotics. I'm not going to get into it too much, but I think robotic surgery has really um, kind of changed the field and allowed us to do much better operations for these patients. Um, I think uh, with the robot, I can do a very extensive mediastinal dissection and extensive esophageal mobilization, which is a very important part of this operation. We know that um, the distal esophagus intra-abdominal is an important component to restoring the lower esophageal sphincter function. Um, and so on the left, you can see, I think the, the left video is actually probably a lot easier to see um, that mobilization in the mediastinum. On the right, again, another patient uh, with a large paraesophageal hernia doing that esophageal mobilization. And so I think this is um, a great addition in terms of our treatment of reflux disease. I do do, um, I, can, I can get pretty high up with this mobilization. And I even do um, transhidal esophagectomies with the robot. And you can get pretty high even up to the carina. Um, with the robot in the mediastinum. And so, again, aids with the esophageal mobilization. Another piece of technology that is um, becoming more popular in terms of foregut and esophageal diseases is the endoflip device and impedance clinimetry. I do use this. Um, I do use it a little bit diagnostically uh, in patients with EGJ outflow obstructions, or there's question about achalasia or something going on in the lower esophageal 
sphincter. I do use this intraoperatively in every um, foregut case. I think it's a very um, useful tool, um, more academic at this point, but also I think it can give you some more information about how you're um, personalizing or constructing this wrap for the patient. And so it, what this does is the device here, it's a catheter with a balloon at the end of it that fills with saline. And it has uh, these probes throughout the catheter that measure um, both pressure and cross-sectional area to calculate a distensibility. And so here it spits out the distensibility within the esophagus. And so here you can see this picture on the left is the distensibility associated with this hiatal hernia down here on the left. You can see the two crews in the esophagus, very lax hiatus here. This is the distensibility that you me I've measured before closing the hiatus. And then after closing the hiatus and uh, constructing the wrap, you can see here a nice hourgla hourglass shape, um, high, higher distens uh, sorry, lower distensibility, a tighter uh, sphincter there with a long length to it. Um, and that's what we want to see when we uh, reconstruct these valves. And then lastly, of course, I do bariatric, so I can't go without saying gastric bypass, I think, has also changed the way we treat reflux disease. Any patient with a BMI greater than 35 with reflux, I think all of us would agree, really should be getting a gastric bypass. Um, I think treating their GERD and their obesity is an important part of, uh, of their treatment. And then... I think BMI of 30 or 35 is somewhat controversial. Uh, I, I, I personally think the patients probably would benefit from gastric bypass, but uh, still a little bit controversial in that BMI range. And so I'll end on this. Who should be offered surgical consultation? In my opinion, everyone really should be. I think, um, like we said, this is an anatomical problem. It should be an anatomical solution. Any patient that wants to stop PPIU should be referred to a surgeon. Uh, and then anyone that has significant failure with LES really, really should be referred to a sur surgeon. And so I define that as a hiatal hernia greater than three centimeters. Anyone with esophagitis, regurgitation symptoms, or Barrett's esophagus would really benefit from anti-reflux surgery. So I'll end on that note. Thank you again. Um, and then please, uh, I'll open the floor to any kind of discussion. For the second annual Clinical Congress, which is a student scholarship competition involving the students, residents, and fellows. We'll start in five minutes' time. Or?